Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. We're glad you could join us today. Um, we are excited to be beginning a new month together, and hopefully things are going to be pretty much um, opened up um, at our church pretty much full blown in the next few weeks. We hope so. So anyway, um, maybe you guys will be at a place where you think that you can come back and join us, and uh, we'd love to have you study with us in person, but until that time, we'll continue continue to record these lessons. And so um, I just wanted to take a moment this morning before we dig into God's word and just look over our prayer request list. As we normally do, we did have um, a couple of additions uh, to them. Yes, uh, last Sunday, um, we had an aunt of um, Vicki Pounders. Her name is Betty Spires that was put on the list. Uh, we also have Sandy Epperson and Judy Kemp, both of those families, their um, relations to, um, to Tina Niven, and they had deaths in their family, so uh, just remember them. Let's see, uh, Sherry and Bobby Owens, who are friends of Phyllis Weeks. Uh, I think the, the man, Bobby Owens, has cancer, so just continue to remember them. So those are some new names to add to your list. Of course, we want to continue to remember all those that are on our list. Um, school's out now, so we just want to pray that everyone has a safe summer. We're about to start BBS on Monday. We're excited about that. I would ask you to kind of help us spread the word. Remember, we're doing it different this year, so um, it's not five you know, nights in a row, and it's not for everybody all five nights. We have broken it down just to kind of help um, just at the close of the way everything's been with the virus and to keep all the, the students from being so pushed together and moving in from one space to another where that, you know, there hasn't been an opportunity to really clean and sanitize really good because it goes at such a fast pace and there's so many kids there. Um, we're targeting different groups on different nights. So Monday night is our preschool night, age four and five. And remember, we um, we work off of the class that your child just came out of. So if your class just graduated kindergarten, if your child just graduated kindergarten, then that means your child is still going to be in the preschool group, age four and five. Um, that will be Monday night uh, at 630. And then on Wednesday night, we will target grades one through three. So same way, if your child just just came out of third grade, they're not going to move into the fourth grade class. They're going to stay with that group of children on Wednesday night. Um, and then on Friday night, we're going to target age group, you know, four through sixth grade. So if your child just graduated sixth grade, um, you know, and um, they are headed into seventh grade, they're still old enough to come this one last time. And we have age appropriate crafts broken down for each group. And so that's another reason if your child just finished kindergarten, you don't want to send them with the first graders because the, that, uh, the craft may not be age appropriate. It's still broken down for the motor skills of a kindergartner. Um, you know, same way with the Bible content. Um, the, the scripture will all be the same, but it'll be taught differently according to the age groups that are there. So, um, you know, just help us spread the word. Um, there's also an opportunity for the family to receive a free box lunch on Saturday. All you have to do is drive through the church and pick it up. You just have to sign up for it so we know how many people that we're preparing for um the adult uh, mom and dad in the in the household are able to receive a, a barbecue plate um that'll have a barbecue sandwich and you know some chips and a dessert and then um, the students will receive a hot dog plate um, with a hot dog and the, the same thing. So in a family ministry bag, everybody's going to get a, a special goodie bag from the church on Saturday that wants to drive back up and get one. So Anyway, we're excited about this opportunity to, to minister to our families, and we hope that um, that this is going to be a great thing, and our we've been doing a, a month-long prayer request list for Bible school, and today's was for rest for the workers, and um, I, I know that, um, that that's important for me. Uh, we've all been working really hard, and so that, that's my prayer for everybody is that we will just stay refreshed and replenished and that God will give us what we need and the rest and the peace to, to do uh, what is pleasing in his sight this week. So um, thank you for this opportunity for us to go over these prayer requests. And now let's pray and we're going to dig right into the lesson this morning. God, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. Dear God, we love you. We appreciate everything you do for us, dear God. You are a great and a mighty God. And as I sit on this porch this morning and hear these birds in the background of our lesson, dear God, it just reminds me of the great creator that you are. And dear Lord, I am so thankful 
that before we begin teaching this morning, that we can open up our, our study time with a time of prayer and we can bring all these requests before you. Dear God, is it is an exciting time. Summer brings on, you know, warm weather and vacations and all the things that, um, you know, that everybody gets so excited about this time of year. And BBS is one of those things. So we specifically lift up our vacation Bible school to you right now, dear God. You know in advance the students that need to be there. You know the number. And um, dear Lord, I just pray that you would just bless all the preparation that's gone into it. Bless all the teachers. Keep us all safe as we travel to and from. Be with the students and their families, dear God. I pray that you will send us children that uh, have their hearts receptive and open and ready to hear your message, dear God. Um, we pray, dear Lord, that um, that there will be students that will come to know you and those of us that already do, dear God, the students already do. I pray that this will just be a time of renewal and revival for them to draw them closer to you um, as they have this time of break from their peers uh, and the daily classroom, dear God. Just give them an opportunity to grow closer to you over the summer so they'll be back and ready to, to share your word um, by the, the lives that they live in the classroom each day in the fall when school begins again, if you see fit for us to, to, to continue to tarry here for another school year. Now, dear God, bless the reading of your word and be with us as we study over it. And uh, we thank you once again for the opportunity to do so through this technology in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So we are um, just coming off of a six week study talking about, um, you know, sharing our faith in Christ. And so today we're starting a new study that's entitled The Church That God Desires. And the lesson writer just kind of gives a synopsis, just thinking about back in his childhood and all the road trips that they used to take as a family. And he said, sometimes it might be, you know, a certain pre-planned destination, or it might just be getting in the car, you know, on a Sunday afternoon and just taking a drive wherever it takes you. And over the years, um, the lesson writer said that his family has participated in road trips that have taken them through 48 different states. And um, he said they've learned so much from the history and visiting all these historical places and just seeing how the country is formed to come together. And so he says that, that what he wants to do for us is invite us to join him on a journey through um, through visiting seven churches that Jesus has delivered messages to in the book of Revelation. So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, for the next six weeks or so. We're going to be looking at the book of Revelation and um, maybe it's seven weeks. I'm not sure. I didn't look at the number, but anyway, we're we're going to be visiting seven churches. So I don't know if, if a couple will be combined, but I know for at least six weeks, we'll be studying together about these messages that Jesus has given to the first century churches and thinking about how we can apply these things to our own individual lives and the churches that we're a part of today. So it's kind of like taking a virtual road trip, um, you know, through time to see what God has to. Um, bring to us from these passages in the book of Revelation. So today, as we kind of get started, I want you to think for just a second about your first love. Think about, um, you know, maybe the crazy things that you did to draw um, that person's attention, to get that person to notice you, to get that person to to realize, you know, that you were fond of them. Um, have you ever done anything just crazy for the sake of that love? Um, the lesson writer says, you know, maybe it's a childhood crush or maybe it was a teen infatuation. Um, sometimes we refer to it as puppy love. Um, you know, when I think of the, the phrase puppy love, I always think about myself um, and I can just remember being in the first grade and being completely enamored with Donny Osmond and when he sang the song Puppy Love, oh my goodness, I was so excited when I received his album for Christmas my first grade year and I had this little tiny record player and I remember, you know, my mom showing me how I could put the needle on that song because it wasn't the very first song on the album and, you know, how I could skip over to get to that song and I can just remember putting that needle on that third song, you know, and letting it play and then lifting it up and putting it back on that song and playing it again, um, you know, because I just thought Puppy Love was awesome. And that was, you know, my big crush on on Donny Osmond. I thought this, this song just describes me. And I can remember, you know, holding that album cover up to my chest and just hugging it, you know, because it was just Donny Osmond's, you know, it was like a headshot from his shoulders up. And I, I was so just taken back with him. Um, but, you know, maybe you can think of something that comes to your mind. But as we look back on these first loves from our childhood, um, you know, sometimes we think of silly things we did. The lesson writer says he threw rocks 
rocks at his first love to get her to notice him. And he said that might not have been the, um, the most positive thing that he could have done or the smartest thing he could have done to, to get this little girl to like him. But when we think about our spiritual relationship with Christ and uh, we go back in time to that first time that we came to faith in him, do you remember that love that we felt? Um, you know, it's, it's not like a childhood crush um, because we don't have to do anything to receive his love in return. But over time, I think a lot of times we get busy and uh, we're doing things um, and, you know, we're working for him. Um, and that is an important part of our relationship. But um, we're going to see in this in this uh, passage today in the book of Revelation that our works are not something that replaces the need to keep our first love in the right place, to keep things prioritized right in our relationship with Christ. So we're going to look today at. Um, you know, what that first love looks like. Do we need to return back to that first love that we have for Christ? Um, and we're going to be looking, like I said, in Revelation, and we're going to be in, in the second chapter today, but looking at verses one through seven. And um, the point of today's lesson says that we are to ground everything that we do in love for Christ. So as we go back in time and look at the, the Roman Empire in first century A.D., um, there was you know a time where it spread its military and its political power across the Mediterranean world from Spain to Israel. And there were seven strategic cities that were located in this region. And each one um, had a specific church that was founded in the early Christian era in these seven cities. Um, and so we look to the book of Revelation today to see Jesus himself evaluating the spiritual condition of these congregations through a vision that he has given to the Apostle John. So let's begin to dig deeper and hopefully today we'll get a better understanding of what it means to be characterized by love and and how this love relates to us and our relationship to Christ. Let's begin reading in verses one through three. And it says to the angel and of the church at Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and why Walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance, and I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. So Ephesus, we find, like I said, was literally at the crossroads of civilization. It was home to the Temple of Diana. It was the center of the fertility worship there in, in her temple. And Ephesus was a city full of, of other pagan religions as well. So the church at Ephesus that's being addressed right here was a group that was, they were people that were fully dedicated to who they were serving, to the Lord himself. Uh, they were doing their best to stay on course in their relationship with him. And in spite of all the evil options and the temptation, that were available to them in the city, Jesus was acknowledging the church for the good works that they, that they were putting forth, for staying the course. Their perseverance and their endurance was very commendable, and the Ephesian believers were, were pretty much known for their good works. And so after Jesus' death and resurrection, um, his apostles, in, including John, the brother of James, the son of De Zebedee, um, they scattered throughout the world preaching the gospel. And so let's just see kind of how this letter uh, has come to be written to the church. And um, and like I said, it, it comes from, you know, John himself. And five of John's writings are preserved in the New Testament. And one of those writings includes the book of Revelation that we're going to be looking at. And so tradition says that really and truly, um, when the apostles were scattered, uh, we know a lot of them were martyred for their faith. Faith. And tradition and history uh, kind of, um, you know, leads us to believe that John was uh, the only apostle that was never really martyred for his faith. But later in life, um, because of his faith and his bold ministry for Christ, he was, um, you know, um, living out his, his years, his aged years on this island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Um, and so um, the, the history, um, historic books tell us, like I said, that it had something to do with his zeal, his ministry, his boldness for Christ. Um, you know, if he was put in exile there or he had to serve a certain number of years there, there's a lot of speculation as to how he got there, how long he had to be there. But anyway, while he was there, um, <clears throat> John recounts how on one specific Lord's day, it says he was in the spirit and he witnesses this vision of the risen and the exalted Christ. Um, th those are in verses eight through 20. Um, and um, like I said, that's not part of our text today, but you can go back and look at it if you want to. And the Lord commands John to write down what he's about to hear and what he's about to see and send it as letters to the seven churches in the seven cities of Asia Minor. So like I said, these churches were facing the prospect of increasingly hard persecution. Um, and to each 
each church, the Lord issues this specific message of, of either commendation or warning regarding the quality of the lives and the work um, for his kingdom that they are um, that they are a part of. And um, so the first church that is being addressed here is located, like I said, in this great seaport of Ephesus. And I've already kind of given us a little bit of background about it, but it is one of the largest, one of the most impressive cities. Um, it's built on a bustling harbor that's located on the western shore of Asia Minor. And um, it was a very strategic center uh, for not just religious region reasons, because like I said, there was a lot of pagan worship there, but there was also a lot of political and commercial life that existed in that region. And um, it, 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 there was that, like I said, the, the temple of Artemis, um, the, the goddess, uh, you know, Diana, and it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And everybody was excited, you know, so that was like the goddess of fertility and, um, everybody was just, you know, taken back by, um, how, you know, this had been erected and the temple, like I said, was just known by everyone. And by mid first century, um, it, it, it was the, the city itself was one of the fourth largest cities in the Roman empire. Um, there, there was also a huge theater there that, um, it said had elaborate seating for about 24,000 patrons. Um, so, you know, that was a big deal back in the day, um, you know, to have something like that in their city. So we see that this um, city is a city of great importance. And so um, this is one of the cities that um, the Lord chooses to address with John. And he begins with a greeting to the angel of the church at Ephesus. Now the word translated angel here literally means messenger. Uh, usually we think about in scripture, it being some type of supernatural being. Uh, but in the cases of these letters to the Asian churches, it, you know, it opens up saying to the angel of the church at Ephesus or at Laodicea or, you know, it, wherever these are, the, the letter is written to the angel. And typically in this um, setting, the angel refers to the church's human pastor. So in this context, the pastor was one of the individual uh, was the individual messenger that is designated to hear, you know, the, the Lord's address to his assembled body. And um, it said another thing about it, using the term angel here was a way that it would also protect the pastor's actual identity in the event of the external persecution that was going on. That was uh, like a little sidebar in my commentary, which I found interesting. I'd never um, really heard that before. I knew it was an address to the, to the pastors, but I thought that was interesting. So I just thought I'd throw that out there to you because there was persecution that was going on in the churches at this time. And so in every letter, the Lord introduces himself as a unique, in a unique way. Um, he talks about, you know, the angel being the, the pastor there, but then he also says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, earlier, these phrases had been identified to mean, um, the seven stars as the angels of the seven churches. And, um, then the seven golden lampstands as the seven churches. And so the imagery here emphasizes the risen Lord's power and authority and concern that he has for these Ephesian believers, um, not just to the pastors, not just the angels there, but to the churches themselves. And so we see in verses two and three that the Lord has full knowledge of everything that's happening in the Ephesian churches. Um, we know for sure that, that, that that's not new news. We know that he is, um, you know, omnipotent and he is well aware of everything that is going on and he is omniscient and and he can be everywhere at every time. And so there's nothing that takes him by surprise. And he was assuring the Ephesians congregation here that he knew of their deeds. He knew of their hard work. He knew of their perseverance. Um, it, it says that the word deed there just talks about uh, everything that they are just diligently doing and pursuing after, you know, on a daily basis um, of life in, in the church setting. Their hard work, it said, it is an even stronger term to indicate um, how much they are ministering and, and working on evangelism. And likewise, it says he knew that their perseverance, their steadfast courage in the face of the suffering that was going on around them, the persecution that was taking place, the loss that was taking place. And so Jesus further commends them. Um, because they don't tolerate wicked people. Uh, they simply wouldn't abide by the false teachers who brazenly call themselves apostles that were floating around out there at this time. Um, they they recognize the spiritual counterfeitness of these false teachers um, and 
um, and how they were trying to disturb the fellowship. So the Lord commends all them for having persevered and endured and not growing weary, um, you know, in the center of all this. Ephesus was a center, uh, like I said, of paganism and emperor worship. And he said, um, you know, you've done all this for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. So I think the first thing the lesson writer is calling to um, our attention, just like John was calling to the attention of the, the church at Ephesus, is that we should be known for our good works. What we do for for Christ and his kingdom matters. And we might think our work doesn't matter, um, you know, if no one's watching or acknowledges it, but God sees what we're doing. And and it, it's important for us to be known by our good works. That's a great part of our testimony. <clears throat> Our works have nothing to do with our salvation, but our works are the fruit of our salvation. Um, and our faithful work points others to Christ. Um, our faithful service strengthens and builds up the church and helps us hold each other accountable. So the first thing from these first three verses that we need to just take away is that we should be known for our good works. Um, if I ask us to take a little good works test this morning, um, excuse me, and see what we're producing, you know, would we be known for our works? Um, it, it's important for us to, to, to take a self-examination and kind of see, you know, what kind of works we are producing. What are we doing for Christ? Um, how efficient are we being for him? Um, you know, just like in our, our physical jobs, we would take a little, you know, survey or uh, where I work, we have, a, you know, a, an interview each year, um, you know, before the, the school year is over, just to kind of go over everybody's progress, see what we've accomplished this year. What are some things we need to work on? What are some goals we need to set? What are some things we need to be commended for? What have we done well? What are we lacking? in, um, you know, so just like you do that with your, your physical performance of your job at work, your career, we need to take a spiritual inventory and see what kind of works are we producing. So that's what we see from verses one through three. These works are necessary and we should be known for them. But in the next verses, we're going to see that, that we have to be careful about these works because what are these works being fueled from? In verses four through six, it says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Jesus um, scolds the church at Ephesus here, we see, because they've lost their first love. And while they're doing good things, they're remaining strong and they're staying committed. They're not tolerating evil. They haven't replaced their, their um, you know, their their, their works and, and become lazy for just, you know, being complacent and saying, well, this is just the day and age we live in. No, they, they, they've made it a priority. But what they have done is they've replaced the top priority of loving Jesus. Jesus with a focus on this list of things that they're doing, these things that they're checking off, um, you know, and Jesus's indictment here to the Ephesian church, it says that they've abandoned their first love. And it's a warning, not just to the church at Ephesus in this day and time, but it's a warning to us as well. And we would benefit from, like I said, a periodic self-examination, not just of the works that we've done, like we talked about in these first three verses, but the motivation behind our works. Um, you know, why are we doing these things? So the second thing we want to learn today is not only that are these works um, things that we should be doing, that we should be known for, but a believer's love for Christ is what should be fueling our good works. So up to this point, you know, um, the Lord has been lavishing his praise on the Ephesian congregation, telling them all these things that they've done right, um, you know, just patting them on the back. Um, and, and yes, they've done these things well. They're good works. They've maintained their doctrinal, made it pure. However, he says, there's that word, however, there, there's something that, that that is lacking here. He says, you've forsaken um, your, your love at first. There's something that I have against you. You know, you can imagine that there were probably questions that came across their minds. They're, they were probably per, perplexed, confused. I mean, think about it. What's this first love that Jesus is talking about? Um, have they lost their affection that you know, they had for each other as fellow believers? Have they abandoned their heartfelt love for Christ and his mission? Were they just going through the motions? And the answer to all those questions is apparently, yes, they had. Um, this was an indictment, not about their actions, but about the motives behind their actions. Um, the Ephesians problem was not what they were doing, but why they were doing it. Um, you know, and you think about, I can remember, you know, as a child, um, just the things that I needed to do that we all had chores, you know, things that we had to do around the house. Um, and 
you know, <laughs> what I, I try to teach my kids and I know my parents are trying to teach me that you do these things, you know, not just because they're the right thing to do, but you also do these things out of love and respect for me, your parent, because of all the things that I do for you. You know, so if your job is to take out the trash, then we take out the trash you know, with love because of what, you know, mom and dad have done for us. And I can remember if, you know, if the trash, it wasn't taken out, you know, and my mom calls it to our attention and, you know, rather than coming in and just taking out the trash with a happy heart and a good attitude, if I came in slamming down the empty, you know, the, the new trash bag and, you know, shaking out the old trash bag and rolling my eyes and stuff, I can remember my mom just taking the trash bag, yanking it from me and saying, never mind, I'll just do it myself. If that's the attitude you're going to have, you know, if you're just doing it to check it off your list and to, to, you know, just to, to say, I'm going to do this. So mom will stop talking to me about it. Then I don't want you to do it. If you can't do it because you love me, I don't even want you taking out the trash, you know, and that's kind of what Jesus was talking about to them. They labored hard. All right. Um, you know, and they were efficient in their mission, but they were deficient in the most important thing about that mission. And that was love itself. They apparently had grown cold in their love for each other and for Christ. Um, they were busy doing spiritual things and teaching the right doctrine, but they lacked that critical ingredient. And that was God's agape love for mankind himself and for Christ and everything he had done for them. So that's what he's talking about in verse four. And in verse five, he just says, look, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just consider how far you've fallen. You know, just go back to the time when you were young in your faith and you were filled with love. Um, you did God's bidding out of gratitude and devotion. But as time passed by, you know, you've unconsciously lost that passion for why you're doing these things. And the Lord commands them to repent and do the things they did at first. Now, a lot of times we think about repentance being the uh, repentance being that basic requirement to um to uh, have a relationship with christ you know because an, as an unsaved person we're commanded what to repent of our sins those abcs admit you're a sinner believe that jesus is god's son confess your faith in christ jesus as lord and savior ask him to come into your heart and you know and then we we, we receive god's gift of salvation and, and a lot of times when we hear the word repentance that's what comes to our mind but for the believer for those of us that know christ repentance is also duly important because we have sin and things that come into our life we're not perfect there was only one that was and as those sins come in every day it's necessary for us to repent to keep our relationship in the right perspective with god to not have it broken by the sin that builds up and clouds our lives um you know with with even busy tasks um you know that can separate us and so um, this was a warning here, you know, that, that, that God said, I'm aware of all your works. Christ said, I'm aware of all your works, but I also see that there is a weariness or even an apathy um, that has come about in your life because of, of you know, maybe the sourness that this, that, that has poured in here because of your lack of love, um, the sin that has been, been accumulating because of your disregard for your true love for me. And um, he's saying, don't ignore this warning. Um, you know, if they did ignore the warning, he said, you know, I'm going to come and remove your lampstand from its place. Now that, that has nothing to do with salvation. It doesn't mean if you don't do these things the way I'm saying them, I'm going to, you know, take you away and, and, you know, you're not going to have this relationship with me. No, what it's talking about is that they're going to inevitably lose their usefulness for Christ if they didn't return to their first love. And for all practical purposes, um, the Ephesian congregation is going to cease to be the true church church that, that Christ wants them to be. And too many churches that we can think of today that we can see have lost that zeal you know, to, to minister the gospel from, from Christ's love in their heart. They may have great programs. They may they may be uh, even have great size, but, you know, just because we're checking all the boxes with the programs and the things that are taking place doesn't mean that, um, that those works and those programs are motivated by gratitude and love for Christ himself. You know, so we have to think about it. Why do we have vacation Bible school every year? Is it because that's just a summer thing that we do? Um, that's just part of our agenda. That's the way we've always done it. Or is it because we have a true love for the children that are around us and we want all those children to hear God's word, um, you know, we, so we have to go back and look at the things that we're checking the boxes off of and say, you know, where is the motivation behind these works that we're doing? 
doing. The Ephesians had lost their love for God. We see that in verse six. Um, you know, they had lost it, but he was still pleased with them for their hatred of the teachings of the Nicolaitans, for the false practices that were out there. So even though he's chastising them, he's still commending them for making good choices. But he's saying, think about why you're making the, these good choices. Um, you know, I hate these false practices that are out there. I don't hate the, the people that are, that are, you know, involved in them, the, the, but he said, but I do hate their heretical and their immoral practices. Um, and because of that, you know, as you're ministering to these Nicolaitans, these people that are choosing wrong, you know, think about the motivation as to why you're doing it. Um, you know, turn around, return to the love that you had at first and keep doing what you're doing, you know, because these things that you're doing are commendable things, but work and serve with a love that keeps me first place, you know, as Christ is talking. Our good works are to grow out of our love for him. So, yes, we're supposed to have good works. And yes, um, the most important thing about those good works is that they should come from a passion and a drive and a love that we have for Christ. And in the last verses, we see that we remember that one day we're going to dwell with Christ forever. So verse seven says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, you know, think about it just as a child, how you experienced so many times when um, you were accused of not listening. You know, you're just not listening, maybe your parents would say. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Um, you know, maybe your parents told you to do something and you didn't do it. Maybe there was a teacher that, you know, shared an important piece of information that was going to help you, um, you know, pass a, an upcoming exam. Maybe there was a pastor, you know, that gave a message that would keep you on track in your relationship with God. If we're all honest, you know, at some point or another, we are all found guilty of not listening um they were like well this was said did you not say, did you not hear it um i know i i'm at our faculty meetings, I type up an agenda with everything we're going to address because I want to have something in writing because inevitably somebody's going to come to me, you know, and sometime within that month after we've had a meeting, uh, you know, saying what's going to take place this month. And they're going to say, I didn't know about that. Um, and we'll say, well, we talked about it in the faculty meeting. And, you know, part of me wants to go, well, you're not listening. Um, but, but I write it down so I can say, you know, it's in your faculty notes. So that they have something they can go back to and pull. So they can't say, you know, well, Carrie didn't mention it. Carrie didn't even talk about this. I didn't even know anything about it. So I do that, you know, kind of as a checkpoint for me too, so that I can go back and go, well, did I talk about it? Did I say it? Because sometimes I can't remember myself. Um, but if we're all honest at one point or another, we're, we're found guilty of not listening. Um, you know, I tease all the time saying that when I'm talking at home, uh, uh, you know, Brother Todd's really busy. He works two jobs. And, you know, sometimes I know that when I'm talking, he's just, he's looking at me, but he's just hearing, well, wow. You know, so he hears the noise, but it's really not sinking in. And failure to listen in most any situation brings about what? A negative consequence. It's going to bring about an argument later on in your marriage because you're going to say, I told you. No, you didn't tell me that. You know, or you're going to miss something important, uh, you know, that you were um, going to drop the ball on in your workplace because you weren't listening and you failed to, you know, do something. Um, you know, like I said, maybe it's something in church where the pastor gives us, you know, specific points each week. There will be great reminders for things that we need to do to enhance our spiritual walk with Christ. And if we miss one of those things, one of those points, you know, something that we'll be lacking in, um, you know, it's something that we just we drop the ball on, we forget to do. So listening is very important. And Jesus is alerting them to the fact that he is communicating some very important information to his congregation at this time, to this church that he's getting John to write this letter to. And those whose minds and hearts were open to these teachings would not only hear his words, but they would take them to heart and they would act on them in obedience to his command. So Jesus closed, um, you know, all of his seven letters with a unique promise relevant to each specific um, situation. And in the closing to this letter, you know, he says um, to, to those who hear what I'm saying to th this is the one who's going to be victorious and I'm going to give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So he said, you know, to the one who's victorious, this this means a victor, an overcomer, a person who, despite hardship and opposition, even persecution, uh, admonishes, um, you know, the 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 Lord as, as who He is, and um, gives Him the love that He is due. And it says the Greek term there is is. Uh, an athletic or military metaphor emphasizing superiority and victory over a defeated enemy. And so in Ephesians case, the conqueror specifically is the one who repents and turns back to his love for Christ.
So, you know, think about what good is going to come about in this Ephesian church if they repent and they begin to apply what the Spirit is telling them to do. If they're already reaping benefits from the good works that they're sowing out there, imagine how much more God's going to bless them if they do it from the right motivation and with the right heart, you know, and also the fact that there's a promise that they're going to ultimately dwell as a victor with Christ forever. So those who truly follow Christ, not just in word or deed, in, you know, in action, in, in works, um, but with Christ as their first love in their heart, they're going to experience a real victory of Jesus and sharing the gift of eternal life that only comes through him, um, you know, that, that's going to be abundant, not just life, but abundant life, you know, is what Christ promises us. He doesn't want us just to have life. He wants us to have it what? More abundantly, with more than we could ever possibly imagine or think of. Um, uh, it, it gave an illustration in closing about the cell phone company that used to use the slogan, can you hear me now? Remember the guy would be walking through all these adverse situations, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, and I know the company no longer uses that ad, the lesson writer says, but the words are still very appropriate for those of us who follow Christ. When it comes to the spirit speaking into our lives, you know, he's asking us, can you hear me now, Carrie? Can you hear me now, Brother Todd? You know, what is our response going to be? You know, let's take to heart what we hear in this message and let's choose today to live victoriously because of the love that we have for Christ. You know, we, we have accepted that love that he's given to us as, um, you know, as Savior and Lord, and we have him in our hearts, you know, but, have, you know, do we still have that same fervor and that love for him that we had in the beginning when we, when we first asked him to come in? So think about practical ways, you know, that you can demonstrate that love. Go back to the point of today's lesson that we ground everything we do in that, in that love for Christ. Remember what that puppy love was like, you know, the deep and enduring love of Christ goes well beyond that, you know, it's well beyond my hugging the Donny Osmond album, you know, it's much deeper than that. That phase didn't last very long. You know, I outgrew that, but I'm never going to outgrow my love um, for the Lord and what he has done for me. So let's encourage one another to love as he loves. And as we begin this spiritual journey, looking at these churches, let's think about what it means for us to model for our church, um, you know, the, the things that he's talking about to these seven churches. Let's be the, the, the small group that steps up and says, we're going to show and we're going to be the examples of this true love and this motivation behind what we do for him um, and what it means to ground everything that we do in a true love for Christ. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for this love. We, we couldn't be talking about the love that we should have for you this morning if it weren't for the love that you demonstrated for us on the cross. Um, we're so thankful and so grateful for that. And dear God, I know that you would have done it if it had just been me, um, but you did it for every person. You discriminated against no one. Um, Everyone has the option and the opportunity to invite you in and experience this love firsthand. And as we've experienced that this morning as your believers, dear God, help us in turn to share it with others. Help us not to be guilty of just checking off our to-do list, but to do the things that are on that list, dear God, out of a true motivation for you and a love for you. And if, and if we can't do that, dear God, if the list is too exhaustive, then maybe we need to take a step back and go, what am I doing just for the sake of checking boxes? And what am I doing? Because I truly feel like this is what God has called me to do because of, of, of the great love that I have for him and what his spirit is speaking to me and what he is calling me to do. Give us the discernment to, 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 to know the difference, dear God. Give us the, um, the attitude of Christ and all that we do, whether we're driving through um, the morning traffic or whether we are, um, you know, teaching a Sunday school lesson or we are, you know, folding clothes, you know, doing laundry for the family or um, taking out the trash, whatever it is, dear God, help us to do it not just in word or deed but in the love that you've called us to do it in because of what you've done for us we love you lord we thank you for the example that you've given us this morning um in this letter that you've given to this church help us to learn from it and to follow through with the action of love in jesus name amen